Viper, we've talked about this one before, it's basically lunar prospecting. There originally was a resource prospector killed by NASA a long time ago, the Viper came along, and everybody was excited about that, and then they killed that. It's back. <laughs> the zombies have returned. There it is. It has headlights. No other lander has ever had headlights before. So what is it? It's basically there to do prospecting, in particular looking for water, ice, and, and any other volatiles there might be. The goal is really to look for in situ resource utilization, what you really need if you're going to be living on another planetary body near the South Pole. As long as you're in a deep crater there, there's no sun that ever reaches it. There should be ice in there. Occasionally, they blasted pieces of spacecraft or entire spacecraft into these things. The plumes have shot up, they've sampled, and they found that, yes, no, there's water there. So it could really help because it says that you can manufacture stuff. You can get the oxygen out of the water. You can get hydrogen out of the water for fuel and so on. Basically, one way to look at it is Artemis is still kind of camping trips when you get down to it. It's a short visit and then you're gone. And there's this other lurking goal in the background that we'd really like to spend a lot of time there, build up research stations, build up manufacturing to support future space missions and so on. But you need to start exploiting the resources. And that's what Viper's all about. NSS, the Space Society, has supported this one very strongly in the past. So it's about the size of a golf cart, a little less than 1,000 pounds. It's got a one meter yardstick, basically, drill. It's got three spectrometers on it to analyze the samples when it drills. It's powered only by solar power, which is kind of interesting because they're planning on living through more than one lunar night. The good thing is that down at the pole, you have to kind of visualize how if that table is the plane where the moon orbits around the Earth and the sun is off that way, it's in the same plane, essentially. If you're at the pole, you have sunlight even during your winter. Most of the time, the sun is coming in kind of horizontally, which is why on this picture, uh, if you look at the left-hand side of this, those are the solar cells there on the side. You can see it better in this next picture here. The South Pole is very favored because you have a lot more solar power available to you. What they're planning to do is when their battery runs low, they're going to run back up to the top of the nearest mountain. They're probably heading for a plateau, but they're going to find places where they have sun a lot more often. So, I mean, anyway, it's a challenge. You have to drive into dark craters. So, you, one, you have to be pretty sturdy to do that. And two, of course, is you have to be able to see. Three is you have to not tip over. You know, and four is you have to have the power to support all that. And it's very, very cold, much, much colder. Nobody else has had to deal with that. Normally, yeah, you get a couple hundred degrees fluctuation day and night on the moon. But you go into those craters, you're down like minus 400 Fahrenheit. The other thing is the shadows move very fast there because the light is always coming in very close to the horizon. Slight differences make a huge difference. And that has actually hurt a lot of the landers that we've sent. Um, every country has sent. Whenever they try to use optical landing, they've gotten tricked because of the shadows so long. It kind of screws up your estimates. You think you know what the altitudes of things are from looking down from space. They've had lunar orbiters mapping the moon for quite a while. Looking straight down, and you know they can see one thing in shadow. It looks quite different. Anyway, so the nights at least are not as long in the polar summer. They're looking at saying four days. You don't really know what the terrain is like. It's kind of unknown. I've seen some animations that they can basically do some elevation of the wheels and kind of do a certain amount of walking motion. They can also spin on their own axis. The four wheels you see there, they can rotate them 45 degrees and turn the thing into a circle. So much more maneuverable than your typical rover. So the history originally it was going to be on the Griffin Lunar Lander by Astrobotic, but that wasn't ready. I think Viper wasn't ready, and I don't think the Griffin Lander at the time was ready either. And everything got delayed a couple of years. Anyway, it was built uh, 450 million or so. It's probably the most expensive of the commercial lunar payloads. Anyway, it was behind schedule, and NASA was looking for things to cut, so they killed it in July of 2024. There was a lot of outcry about that, including from the National Space Society. NASA's been looking for a while what to do. They put out several requests for bids. They said, okay, if you just take it and take care of it, we'll give it to you. But they didn't get any takers for that. Finally, Blue Origin has agreed to pick it up. Back on September 19th, they picked Blue Origin to the Lunar Viper to the moon. There's still some testing that has to be done. That was where the Viper was before. It was pretty much finished, but there was a lot of testing. They had done some vibration testing, but they had a lot more things to do. Blue Origin was the only bidder for this. Astrobotic, you might think, would have done it, but I think they just had enough other stuff going on that uh, they gave up. Why didn't anybody else bid on it? Well, besides the risk, the other things are it's just too heavy. Firefly was one of the other competitors, um, as was Intuitive Machines. Neither one of their landers are hefty enough to handle that. 
it's not clear what'll happen because NASA lost all their staff. When they shut this thing down, they pretty much reassigned everybody. So who knows what's actually going to happen, but at least in principle now, there's a plan. I guess that's about it. Other space-related videos or slide presentations by me are available at the link shown here. That includes a list of videos at my YouTube channel, so you can view them or subscribe for notifications about future videos. These presentations are mostly made as part of the meetings of National Space Society's North Houston chapter, and the link to that is shown. Topics like these are presented as part of a monthly news segment, and there are also lots of other interesting speakers and open discussions. You can attend in person or online via Zoom. Come join us.